Is it Ava just one shot? You got it? Yeah. <laughs> She's a one shot one. I, 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 you got everybody? Oh, yeah. oh, 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 Yes, that's correct. Yes. I love when cameras start to look like a creature from. I know. Like this is from the, the new Dark Crystal show, right? I think. Stranger Things 4. Hello. Good, how are you? Nice to meet you. Has it been coming? Has it been coming? I promise this is not going to be in German. It could be. It could be, no. Be fine. I wanted to make it usable for them as well. Right. Um, so, um, Fre uh, Frederick? Oh, Freddie. Freddie, okay, Freddie. Um, as a composer who has worked in many different media, uh, TV, film, video games, um, does your you have a certain process for your your own personal process for composition? Does that change depending on the project that you are working on? And and um, when you work with the director, the showrunner, how does that influence, or how can that influence your um, your process? That's a really interesting question. Um, because there's certainly certain components of my job that are always the same, which is me walking in my studio and sitting at my desk and hitting my keys. But how I think about the movie and the characters is very much influenced by who I'm working with. Because directors will come in and tell me a very simple thing like, just before we do any spotting, let's talk about how I want the audience to feel when the movie ends. And it's things like this that immediately change how I'm looking at a project or a movie or a story. And uh, yeah, and sometimes it's very s systematic where we go from start to finish and we discuss every character and, and where things are going and, and, and that sort of guides my way. In the Dragon Prince it's a very interesting, different aspect because they never tell me what happens next. So I'm kind of in the same seat as the audience is, which makes it, I think, it, it puts my mindset in a different place as if I would know everything. And maybe that's, an that's a good way to go and it will keep the music innocent enough so things are not necessarily, you know, spoiled too soon from a musical perspective. So, yeah. So there, are, there are some exceptions to that, right? So there's a character yeah. in The Dragon Prince who was kind of hidden for the first entire first season, really. True. And we discussed that character with you so that you could kind of introduce some themes around this mysterious character in the first minutes of the show, even though we don't meet him until season two. Yes, but they only gave but me yeah. like very rough details. I don't think you guys went into too okay. great detail okay. on what's going to happen. It was just like, yeah. by the way, this guy will come back and he might be... Mm -hmm. That's kind of all I knew. Okay. And I think that was probably enough. Yeah. Yeah. But, but people a, notice that. Like, it's, yeah, it's I know. amazing. I, I people on, people mm -hmm. on social media, right? Go the back point and they see it and they realize, oh my gosh, like this character, Erebos' theme is like... The it's already part. there, like in the first minutes of the show. It's, it's cool. Yeah. yeah. So, Freddie, how is it? Um, because I did not realize how much it was accredited for for the DC animated film. So, how is it working on the, the, the genre of super, especially with the really booming era of it being right now? Like, how is it with that concept? And then there's Doom that you're working on. Right. The movie that's there, you know? Yes, very different. Yes. Well, you know, how is it? It's best time of my life. I mean, you know, I, seriously, I get to walk in my studio every day and work on cartoons. I mean, that's like, you know, what else can you really wish for? <laughs> it's, 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 that's it. So, no, it's, it's fun. I mean, I was really lucky to get into the DC line as well because they've created this whole new universe and the string of movies that kind of all connected and I was able to tap into most of them. So it, it almost feels like another giant TV show that's just broken up into movies, but the themes are all over the place for me. Every movie intertwined into all these other films. So it's, it's been fun to structure that kind of along the way. And I again, I didn't know I would be doing this many. So I, I may have would have done things differently if I had known this, but yeah, this is what it ended up, and it's you know it's super fun. Doesn't look like they're slowing down. So yeah, I, I think now you have to I know that things for the long run. Yeah, well, Batman Hush is premiering tonight. Are you coming? I will be there. There you go. There you go. Aaron, what about your? Pro oh, sorry. What about your process? When you are having a new project, right. do you? Does it depend on what the project is or what the media is? When you say, okay, we know we're going to need a soundtrack. I want. I know the sound, and this makes me think of this person. Or does something else step in and uh, influence that decision? And then how do you go for it? Um, you're communicating with them what you want. 
Um, you know, when, when Justin Richmond and I were created the Dragon Prince, we knew we wanted it to be an extremely collaborative project, that we wanted to bring in um, other amazing filmmakers and composer to, to be visionary storytellers, you know, uh, alongside us, and not just people bringing their component. Um, one of the people we were fortunate to bring on early as showrunner was Giancarlo Volpe, who is, is, is an amazing director and a really talented showrunner, and he had worked with Freddie on Green Lantern. And so he kind of um, spoke to kind of, I guess, Freddie's in incredible unlimited uh, abilities to, to bring emotional um, storytelling into his music. And so um, it's really about finding the right person who you believe in. And then, you know, when we talked to Freddie, we connected right away, and um, he did a, a sample of, um, a, for one scene that um, legitimately made my daughter cry, which normally is a reason not to work with someone, but in this case, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was like, all right, well, there we go. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the process is, is often about finding the right people to share the vision with, who you're excited to work with as co-storytellers. That's, that's what we did. Yeah? What should be for you a good collaboration with the director and co -poster? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, what was your? What is for you for you? Good collaboration between director and composer. What? I was the most collaborate to do a movie, for example. Well, I think there's a lot of chemistry between the director and the composers, and you know, it's like it's like what what Aaron said. You just have to find people that are on the same page, so that you kind of say one thing, but. I already know immediately what that means in the long run and throughout the whole season and without having to send a kind of second guess. I'm going to know, I, I always know where these people are at with the story. They trust in me. You know, you have to think about it this way. In animation, unlike, unlike um, live action movies, there is almost never or sometimes very little tent music. Because there's no real time to do that, to spend the time to cut in tent music. So the editors may put in some placeholders here and there, but often it's just it's just there to kind of help the cut. And then when I come in, I more or less ignore most of it and kind of try to do my own thing. To first of all, not be derivative of anything already existing, to kind of add my own personal touch to it, which I know the filmmakers appreciate as well, and hopefully make it better. Because tent music often is just kind of works but it doesn't quite work as well as it can. So and you know there's I have a huge there's a there's a big field of creativity that I can search in and, and, and it's it's really fun to work with people where first of all that appreciate what I'm bringing to the table and secondly that make me feel comfortable to take risks. Sometimes you work with people where you you're always second guessing everything you're doing because you're like, oh, they don't. They said they don't like French horns. Oh, they this guy's allergic to drums, and you know you kind of, you kind of restrict yourself from all these things where people just kind of impose restrictions on you. But in in Dragon Prince specifically, I'm I feel I can do. I have a cool idea that may be a little bit out there, but I'll do it. And if they say no, then that's fine. I'll do something else. But at least I have the ability to try things, and often something really cool comes out of it. And you know, that, that's really I think having that mutual trust is key to a really good creative process. Thank you. I was just going to ask, just to double down on that for you, Aaron. Yeah. What type of confidence and creative freedom does Netflix give you in order to do that's a good projects? question. <laughs> um, Netflix has created an environment that is that is there's a lot of creative freedom. You go with that. Um, yeah, I mean they they want the creators to bring their vision to the project, um, and we've we've been supported in terms of uh, telling the stories we want to tell and, and the way we want to tell them, and we're grateful for that. Yes, okay. Something I'm always interested in, and it doesn't really matter the medium, is um, a composer's use of, um, hopefully careful use of distance. Is that something um, that, when do you like to use it? How do you choose to use it? 
use within something like the Dragon Prince. And if you have any um, uh, thoughts on that, thoughts on that, or input, I'd like to know what your thoughts as the as, as one of the creators to kind of you know make sure everything fits and is streamlined and telling the tale and not detracting and not um, you know taking someone out of the story. If there's ever been an incident where you have maybe had to be convinced of something um, <laughs> that that it sticks. Well, dissonance is a tricky thing because it can be interpreted as not good sounding or a mistake, even sometimes if not done right. And I think in our case, we don't really limit ourselves to saying this is a preschool show, we cannot use any dissonance, nothing can be creepy or horror music esque. Uh, we don't really do that. We, if something's scary, we go full on scary. If something is, is uh, creepy, we can totally do that. And dissonance certainly plays a big part in that, especially. Um, you know, when there's, I mean, there's a lot of creepy moments in the show well, okay. that, that require, you know, I mean, <laughs> mostly circling around Beer and then his. You mean literally movie. like dissonance, like from like, like from a horror musical movie. dissonance? Yeah, yes. okay. like strings making your the, the, right. the hair on your neck stand up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and we can we we we've, we've set it up so we can do that without anybody thinking it's weird out of place. And that's kind of nice to have that as part of the palette. You know, when things really go weird, you go weird. And Alvaros, his theme, the, first, the, the character we talked about earlier, his theme is actually quite dissonant. It's not, the keys are not related to each other. And the scale is unusual too. So within that, you create a certain dissonance that in one, on one side creates mystery, but also gives you this feeling of this guy is off, something is not quite right, this is... I don't trust him. It's discomfort. It's discomfort, yeah. but but it feels still cohesive and melodic. So it's it's a piece of music. But it, I think we, yeah, we've we've earned that trust from the audience to do that without it being out of place or anything like that. I, it never bothered you. I don't think it, I don't think I've ever gotten a note where somebody said it's too dissonant or this sounds like a mistake. It's yeah. it's been usually different like story points, which is great. So I've used it right, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So. So yes. we know yes. season three <laughs> has been announced. Right. Right. Can you give us a little bit about the direction we may be going? Yeah. Um, definitely an Aaron question. Well, I mean, we'll be talking. We have a panel tomorrow. We'll be talking about it. Some stuff I can't say until then. Hopefully, okay. Make Good. it. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I personally like. Um, I'm so proud of season three. And, it's amazing. Um, the. I think all the things we wanted to do, like I think everyone was coming to the table with all their powers, really strong. Like I don't know, it's there are there's a moment in the middle of season three where we were we were listening to um, your initial score with my wife, and it was at night. And again, I'm telling these stories about him making my family cry, and she was. Um, well, say is uh, she's pregnant, and so she's thinking about motherhood and things like that. And uh, after the scene, she just said she was really shaken. She was devastated. And it's like the the, the season is going to be really powerful, and we're really proud of it. And like, and when you when you hear the season, you're going to be blown away. It's it's so good. I think it'll fulfill all the fans' expectations. All right. I mean, yeah. Anything you want, I think anything you want to see is going to be there. It's going to be very satisfying. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, kind of.